The last two weeks in our Jesus emoji series uh, have been kind of heavy, right? Two weeks spent back to back in the anger and in the sadness of Jesus. And I want to thank you all for hanging with me through the thick stuff. And we're going to bounce back this week, though, because it was not all doom and gloom uh, with Jesus. The emoji that we're diving into today falls on the opposite side of the emotional spectrum. And there was an old camp song we used to sing as kids at Canoe Cove Christian Camp. That was the that song was the one that introduced me for the very first time to today's emoji. And so what I want to do is I'm going to ask my little baby salsa to come over here, and we're going to sing that song for you. Come on over here, baby girl. All right, there we go. Can you say hi. Hi. All right, ready to sing that song? Yeah. I've got it's the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down, down in my heart. Down in my heart, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, down in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. That was awesome, baby. Thank you so uh, much. But growing up, and you can go upstairs with Dryden, sweetheart. Growing up, uh, that's how I was introduced to the word joy, right? In that song, you hear the song, it's like, uh, down in my heart, and I'm so happy, and I've got the joy. Joy, I was introduced to the happiness and joy kind of being the same thing. As a matter of fact, I asked one of my youth leaders when I was in middle school, so what is this word joy? And the youth leader's answer was, well, it's kind of like, happiness. And while I'm thankful for my Sunday school teachers and my youth leaders who took the time to answer my questions, I wish they had been a little more accurate because I didn't hear, uh, learn till years down the road that while happiness and joy are interconnected, they're kind of related. There's some overlapping. There is a difference. There's a difference between happiness and joy. You see, happiness is based on circumstance. It's that feeling we get when we wake up in the morning and we have like the perfect day or something incredible happens, right? We, we have happy moments all the time. Maybe you're on a sports team and your team won the championship, that happy feeling that fills you. We love those kind of feelings. You study for a test, students, and, and then you grind it out and you're not sure about your grade and then you get it back and it's an A plus. That feeling inside of you is like, woohoo! Or dudes, man, you've been stressing about asking her out for weeks or months. And finally, you build up the courage to say, will you go out with me? And she says yes. And that feeling that overwhelms you, man, those are all happy moments. By the way, I'm a little bit depressed today because for the last month, uh, for the last five weeks on Sunday evenings, I had what was uh, scheduled as personal happy time from 9 to 11 on Sunday evenings because uh, ESPN released a documentary called The Last Dance. And that documentary chronicled the life and times of the great Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player to ever play the game. And so it was, I told the kids, I said, I locked my door. I said, you're not allowed inside. This is personal, holy time for me. I had my drinks and my food and I just soaked up the happiness of enjoying the retelling of that story that took me back down memory lane. Listen, the documentary ended last week, so I've lost my reason to be happy, but I'm okay. That's happiness, right? Happiness is based on the good things that happen uh, to you. Joy is not that way at all. Joy, by the way, it's not, it's not circumstantial happiness. Joy is soul happiness, right? And in fact, the feeling of joy can remain with you, not just remain with you, actually carry you even through the worst of circumstances. Uh, things have been tough for my family lately. That's no shock to anybody. And uh, when Emily uh, flew to California a couple weeks ago, that night I laid in bed and there were tears uh, rolling down my cheeks. But there were two kinds of tears that were rolling down my cheeks that night. One, there, there were tears of sadness. Sadness that this fight for Luna's life, uh, she's, she's just, she's been so much suffering, but this fight for her life has taken her away from me. Uh, once again, I was desperately sad about that. And there were a different kind of tears rolling down my cheeks at the same time. There were actually, in a weird way, tears of joy. Joy that God is going to tell a story in her that's unbelievable. And joy that, that man, she has a mother fighting for her tooth and nail every second of every day alongside of her. And that brings me great joy. You see, sadness and joy can exist in the same moment. They can. Jesus, by the way, felt great joy. It is our emoji of the day. Will you bow your heads and just pray with me for a moment? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts 
Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, before, by the way, diving into the joy of Jesus, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, there's something that you and I need to be aware of. If we have any aspiration of being filled with the same kind of joy that filled Jesus, and it's this, that the joy, by the way, is resourced by the Holy Spirit. It's the only way to get true joy, by the Holy Spirit. And Paul talked about this in Galatians 5.22. He said this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He says you can't put rules on these things. Against such things there is a no law. In other words, you might possess one of those qualities we just listed, one of those feelings to a degree, right? Like you might have a little bit of joy. You might have a measure of peace in your life when things are going well. You, because you're a disciplined person, may have a little bit of self-control. But you will never, ever possess those qualities in spades without the Holy Spirit. You see, you can't have the joy, you can't have joy in abundance without the Holy Spirit in abundance. And so uh, knowing that as kind of the backdrop of what we're saying, let's take a look at the joy of Jesus because I believe I believe the Gospels highlight three things that clearly brought Jesus joy. And were there others? Well, maybe, probably things that he did by himself or with his disciples or a time alone with his father that brought him joy. But you know what? The reality is this, that this book does not record all of the things that Jesus said and did. As a matter of fact, the very last uh, stroke of the gospel, John 21, 25, tells us that, that, man, that Jesus did so many other things as well, so many that everything were recorded down that Jesus did while he was on earth, that all the libraries in the world would not be able to hold the books that told those stories. So were there other things that brought Jesus joy? Probably. But there's three things in the gospels that we know for sure that did. So three things that brought, if you're taking notes, three things that brought Jesus joy. And the first is this. Jesus found joy in obeying his father. In John 15, Jesus explains to his 12 disciples exactly that. That was one of the sources of Jesus' joy, obeying his father. He said this in his words, if, if you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've kept my father's commands and I remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be in Complete. In other words, Jesus says, the joy I have, it doesn't come from a magic potion or a secret formula or a special sauce. No, no, no. It comes because I obey. Because I obey, there is joy in obedience. And that's exactly what Jesus did for 30 years, right? 33. Every single day of his life, he obeyed his heavenly father. This blows my mind. But have you ever stopped to wonder what that conversation might have been like? Like when God first approached this whole going to earth thing with Jesus, and when God came up to him in heaven and said like, okay, son, uh, son, I have something I want to talk to you about. I, son, I need you to go to earth. You know, Jesus probably said what? Like, okay, dad, anything you need, I'm all in. Just let me know when it's time to go. No, no, son, you don't get it. Like, I need you to be born. What do you mean? Born, dad? Like through the birth canal, dad? Like I'm going to poop and pee and people are going to have to change... My diaper, that kind of born, Dad? Yes, son, I need you to be born. Okay, Dad, I'm all in, I guess. I, I, just one question, why? Uh, well, I guess, son, because I need you to die. What? So wait, wait, yeah, let me get this right. So you want me to be born so that I can eventually just die? That's the plan? Yes, son, it's the plan. And it's the only way. And then what did Jesus say? Okay, I'm all in on that plan. And he did. He obeyed his father every step of the way, right? You name it. Go to this town and teach. And he did. Talk to this person. He did. Heal them. He did. I want you to fast for 40 days. And Jesus did that. Listen, every day he obeyed his father every second to the point where it led to his death. Death, even the Bible says, death on a cross. And I have to imagine that every night, when Jesus' head hit the pillow at night, that he was filled with this unbelievable, indescribable joy because he knew his father was smiling down on him because, by golly, his son had obeyed. You see, there is, there's joy in obedience. And I, I've been trying to teach my kids that lesson for years, that joy comes when you obey your father, right? That the joy for doing something right, it's not a lollipop. It's not, it's not let's go to the mall. It's not you get a sleepover, although my kids desperately miss those the reward for obeying your father is knowing that, by golly, you found a way to obey your father. And there ought to be great joy and there ought to be great satisfaction in that. Which is why 
I celebrate, I celebrate obedience in our house. A salsa is the queen of the fit. She just is. And she is learning the hard way that a fit will never get you what you want. And she's a slow learner in this. Uh, three weeks ago, she threw the biggest fit I've ever seen, at least from her. Dryden had one when she was two that rivaled her when we were living at the Brentsville High School. This one left, the, it was kind of left that in the dust. We were upstairs. It was time for bed. And when I put salsa to bed, it takes about a half hour once we're in a bedroom because there's a few things that we do every night. One, we start with tickle torture. She just loves to be tickled, so we're rolling back and forth. And then she wants to play Barbies, right? And so I've got a lot of girls, so I've got a pretty good Barbie game. And so we're going back and forth. And I sing a song, kiss her, put her to bed after we pray, that kind of thing, right? Well, that night we get into bed and she had not had a good day. Salsa had not obeyed. She was, uh, she was making fun of the other kids. When she was at dinner time, she was getting up and down from her seat, which she's not supposed to do. And so when we got upstairs, because she had had not a good obedience day, one of the things that we do as, as parents is we try to revisit, right? Well, you made these choices, and because of that, these kind of things happened and evaluate. And so when we were in bed that night, I said, Salsa, sweetheart, we're not going to get to do the tickle torture. We don't get to play Barbies tonight because... You threw some big fits today and you weren't listening real well. And boy, she did not want to hear that, right? She looked at me and she stiffened up and she said, well, I'm never talking to you again. And she laid down there for about five seconds. And then she rolled over and said, Papa, what are you doing? And I looked at her and I said, Salsa, you said you're never talking to me again. So I, I guess we're, I'm not going to answer. And she, when she heard that, went irate. She started swinging her fists and punching me and kicking me and then kicking the wall and punching the wall. She took her pillow, threw it on the floor, all the toys threw it on the floor. I mean, she was going berserk. She got up on the bed and grabbed the headboard and was shaking it back and forth and banging it against the wall. And at this point, I'm thinking, this is rental furniture. We can't do this, girlfriend. So I pick her up and I drop her on the bed and I literally pin her down till she finally calms down. It took almost a half hour for her to work herself all the way through the point of just being at peace. And I get up, I kiss her and I tell her I love her and I walk out of the room, right? <clears throat> well, I want to make sure she's still in bed. So five minutes later, I peek my head into the bedroom and I look and she's laying there and she's still kind of rigid. And I said, Salsa, I said, I love you. And she said, Papa, Papa, I have something serious I want to tell you. And so I'm like, oh, cool, because I walk over to her bed, I sit down, I know what it is. Because of all the kids, man, she is, she's, got so, she's got a soft heart. She's the quickest to repent and say, I'm so sorry, and will you forgive me? So I sit down, and I'm just, I'm getting ready. I'm about to eat up this incredible, I'm sorry speech. There's going to be hugs and tears. Salsa, you said you have something serious you want to tell me? She said, yeah. She said, Papa, I forgive you for being the meanest Papa ever. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, what happened to forgiveness? But listen. She's still learning to obey, so here's what I do. Because I've challenged her again and again, you can't have those fits, you can't throw toys and chairs. Like, I understand you have a short Puerto Rican fuse, I get it, right? So when something goes down in her house and I tell her, no, Salsa, you can't, and she looks at me and she says, okay, Papa, and walks away. Like, I go nuts for that. Like the other day, I'm standing by the sink and she walked up to me, Papa, can I have a treat? And I said, no, Salsa, you already had a treat and it's about time to eat dinner. And she looked at me and said, Okay, Papa, and walked away. I was like, whoa, girl, come here. And I picked her up and I grabbed her in her arms and I'm dancing back and forth. I'm kissing her because I wanted her to see, I wanted her to see on my face how pleased with her obedience I was. And so when she saw that, man, she was smiling from ear to ear. Parents, that's kind of what we're shooting for, right? When your child obeys in the smallest way, I want to challenge you, man. Throw them a way to obey party. I'm serious. I don't, I don't mean buy them something. That's easy. I mean, get up and dance. Give them a fist bump. Let them see how thrilled you are because they need to know how their obedience makes you feel. And when they do, it will fill you with an indescribable, unquenchable joy. And that's the kind of joy, by the way, that you can't put a price tag on. And just so you know, here is what's at stake in this parent's. I want you to think about this. If they can't find joy in obeying their earthly parents, how in the world are they going to learn to find joy in obeying a heavenly parent, right? It, because that's the purpose, isn't it? To find joy in obeying, doing the will of our Father. I mean, that's the exact point Jesus was making in John 15. Just like I obey God and it brings me joy, I need you to understand that if you obey God, it will bring you joy, right? A joy that no one can steal from you. So I guess the question is this, how much joy do you have? 
How much joy do you have? Because there is a correlation between the level to which we obey God and the level of joy we have in and from God. And this, I guess, is a little bit of sin confession time. Uh, because for me, the most miserable times in my life personally are always when I'm living in, in disobedience to God. They just are. A few years ago, in my previous church, probably seven years ago, I, I felt the Holy Spirit nudge me on something. There was a guy in my previous church, and we were friends, good not, not good friends, but casual friends. We hung out from time to time. And I walked by him in the back of the church, and while I walked by him, I, helped, I felt the Holy Spirit. I, I heard kind of this, this voice whisper to me, I need you to confront him. And I'm like, confront him? For what? And I'm like talking to God the whole church service because he's sitting three rows up. And I'm like, what am I? Like, God, I can't walk up and say, hey, I need to talk to you. But I don't have any clue what it is that you want me to talk to him about. And so I'm like, God, I'm not doing it. You got to give me more here. And so I didn't. For three months, I put it off. For three months, I told God, no, I'm not going to talk to him until you tell me why. Listen, for those three months, I was miserable. I would lay in bed at night and, and just rack my brain over what it could be. And my joy was gone because I was not obeying the Father. So finally, I'm a little bit stubborn. Three months in, I call him up. Hey, can we get together? And he comes over and he sits on my deck. And we're having this conversation, right? Here's how the conversation begins. Unbelievable. He sits on my deck and he looks at me and he says to me these words. Uh, I'm guessing, you know, you, you, you know what I'm about to say already, probably. And then he'd proceed it to confess that he'd had this attraction for another girl and he was barreling towards an affair and he hadn't crossed those lines yet, but by golly, it was close. And, and he, I, listen, I didn't even have to say anything. I just, he sat there and he spurted the whole thing out and, and man, all I needed to do was obey God. Now I'm stubborn. It took me three months and, but guess what happened that night when my head hit the pillow? My joy was back because I obeyed the Father. Listen, that's what happens when you obey God. There's a beautiful joy inside of it. John Howe said it this way, God is to be obeyed. And once he's obeyed, only then can he be enjoyed. I think so many of us want to enjoy God without the obedience. It doesn't happen that way. You see, joy is the byproduct of obedience. And Jesus, by the way, found joy in obeying his Father. That was the first thing. If you're taking notes, the second thing is this. Jesus found joy in his purpose, right? And his purpose is not something most of us would like to sign up for. Come to earth, carry a cross, die a horrific death, being drunk naked through the streets for our sins. I mean, Luke 19.10 tells us that was his purpose, to seek and save the lost. And guess what? Guess where all that saving happened? It culminated on a cross, right? No cross no forgiveness. His purpose, plain and simple, was to die for our sins, and he found great joy in that purpose. Do you know how we know? Hebrews 12, 2 says this, set your eyes, focus your vision on Jesus. Why? He is the author, he is the engineer, the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he put up with the cross, and seeing its scorn and shame, he sat down at the right hand of God, right? In other words, his purpose was to be the author and the perfecter, the engineer of our faith. We have no faith in God without Christ Jesus. And even though that meant having to endure a cross, he found joy in that purpose. And I think at this point, it would be good to stop and take a good look at that word that's used for joy. The Greek word for joy is chara. C-H-A-R-A is a transliteration of that. So a definition of biblical joy would be this. It's a noun, first of all which describes an unrelenting feeling of inner gladness, delight, or rejoicing. I want us to stop and pause for a minute and look at that incredible phrase. Zone in on the phrase, unrelenting feeling. That word unrelenting, friends, in other words, joy, joy has staying power. It doesn't just go away. That's what distinguishes joy from happiness. Happiness comes and happiness goes. Joy is unrelenting. I love that because it's not based on circumstance. It carries us through circumstances. It's how Jesus could be both Isaiah 53, a man with sorrows and grief, and also be Luke 10, abounding in joy because one does not exclude the other. And so, yes, he could face the cross, even the cross with the joy inside of him set before him. By the way, uh, now, does that mean that the cross was fun for him? 
Absolutely not. We know that's not the case. Luke chapter 22, right? It's the night before Golgotha, Calvary, all that goes down. He's in the garden of Gethsemane with his best friends. And he tells them, I need you guys to hang with me for a little bit. I need some time to pray to God. And the Bible says he falls down on his knees. And three times he prays this very specific prayer. He says, Father, Father, I, I don't want to die. And he says, find another way. May this cup be taken from me. Three times he prays that at the end of the prayer. Now he says this, because obedience, remember, is his priority. He says, not my will, but yours be done. But three times he prayed, God, find another way. Luke twenty two forty four 44 says his prayer is, was so intense that his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Listen, Jesus did not want to die, but he found joy in laying down his life because his purpose was to save you and me. And that was the only way. And he found joy in his purpose. My question is this. What about you? Does your purpose bring you joy? Does your, in other words, what are you living for? Because if you are low on joy, it could be that one, you're not, like we said earlier, living to obey the Heavenly Father. But two, it might be that you're living for something that can never bring you joy. And if so, you need a new purpose. And I have a feeling, by the way, every single one of us have what I call a personal purpose temptation. Something that we could be tempted to live for instead of the pursuit of Jesus. I call it my shallow mission, right? Something that could captivate us or distract us so that we're not living for what God wants us to do and who God wants us to be. We just do have these shallow missions. For some, by the way, of you, it might be money. Stuff, right? The, le the relentless pursuit of more has a lot of us. We're living in busy land, right? And we're filling up a bank account, but that will never fill up our joy account. And maybe there's some of you in here, you, your purpose, you, your, uh, your temptation is to live for pleasing people, right? To make everyone around you happy. And you may like Jesus, but if that's the case, you're never going to be like Jesus because it's it's one thing to please everybody around you. And if you try to do that with your life, you're going to have moments of, of you get this rush, man, that person really likes me, but you will never find joy in Jesus when it's your pursuit to make other people happy instead of him. You just won't. Listen, there are a million things we could pursue. We can make our purpose instead of Jesus. Things like success or, or influence or vanity or popularity. You name it, people pursue it. I know what mine is. Actually, I have... There are probably two things in my life that rival each other for top dog in the things I could be pursuing instead of Jesus. My shallow mission, right? And uh, the first is this. Uh, my temptation, my purpose, a false purpose I can live for is to beat you to destroy you. Like, that's why Emily never wants to play games with me. I'm way too competitive, right? When I, I remember in college, our coach would come in out and before a game, we'd all be in the huddle before storming the court. And he'd come in and say, all right, guys, last thing, let's just go out there and have fun. And he'd walk out of the room and I'd shout, no, no, guys, winning is fun. Let's go crush it. I mean, that's just the way I am. Which is why, by the way, I've been loving the last dance, right? Because Jordan and I, we're kind of the same person in this regard. Now, he's Obviously a little more talented than me, I get it. But man, for him, you're watching that documentary and it's win at all costs. And he understood there's a price to pay when you're committing yourself to winning no matter what. And he, he ticked off teammates and coaches and fans and media because he didn't care. Winning had to be number one for him. And that relentless pursuit of winning, he burned a lot of bridges along the way. Friends, I have that same desire to win at all costs. I love to win, right? And so much so that something shameful to me happened two weeks ago, I think about two weeks ago on Sudley Manor Drive. My friend Jimmy Harris and I, we've been running three times a week and we've been running not just a couple miles, two, three, four, no, no, no. We've upped our ante. We're running seven, eight, nine, ten miles at a time. And so we're doing a run that day and uh, we're coming down Sudley Manor. We're towards the end of the run. So we're a little bit gassed because we're seven, eight miles deep on this thing. And as we're crossing a neighborhood towards where Safeway is, out from the street beside us, there was a young woman that was running. And she was just starting a run and she was moving at a really good pace. I remember looking over at her and looking at Jim and I'm like, dude, like, this is not good. We got to go because you don't understand. I have been running the Lytton Hall corridor for over 10 years. Never once, not once in my life have I ever been passed by anyone, let alone a girl. And I'm not saying that to slam you women. 
just prideful man here. Listen, it's so bad. I remember one time uh, I was running back home. I was running five or six miles, and I'm coming down Limestone by Gainesville Middle School, up around the Catholic Church, Holy Trinity, and I'm just about to head back home. The last one and a half miles, I was gassed. But they were starting a 5K race from Holy Trinity Catholic Church, and they had just shot off the gun, right? And the frontest, the fastest people in the race had just taken off as I had stepped across Lynn Hall Road, and they were right behind me. And they were just starting to race. I'm like, oh no, this is not good. And I'm looking behind them like, they can never pass me. I sprinted the entire way home. One mile and a half. I remember I got to the front yard. I ran into the house and I just passed out on the floor. I would rather die than lose at anything. And so we're on Sudley Manor, right? And I look at Jimmy and she runs right by us because she caught us off guard and just ran. And I'm like, Jimmy, dude, like... We got to go. We got to pass her. We got to go. Let's go, go, go. And I knew he was gassed and probably didn't have it in him. Sorry, Jimmy, if you're watching this. But I, and so here we went back and forth. Should we pass her? Should we not? What if she gets a light? And we're, we're trying to plan our strategy. And we're like, well, if we run past her, it's just going to humiliate her. It's really not worth it. Listen, here's the reason I didn't run past that girl two weeks ago. Because I know Jesus and he's the Lord of my life. No Jesus in my life. I'm sorry. I'm leaving Jimmy in the dust and I'm leaving her in the dust. And I don't care what they think because my secondary mission is to win at all costs. Thank God that he's still redeeming me. And that my second uh, thing I could live for is this. I could live for pleasure. Like there's something about me that everything in my life, it has to be fun. For years, I was a class clown making jokes all the time. And, and every meeting I go in, I got to find a way to make people laugh. I try to make funerals fun for kind out loud. I could live for pleasure. Listen, if I'm not careful, that could be a purpose of mine. Here's why all this matters. Because Jesus found joy in the purpose set before him to lay down his life for us. But he didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. He didn't, he didn't stop at just making it his purpose. He said, if we have any aspirations of following him, we have to make it our purpose. Matthew 16, 24 says, anybody who has a hope of coming after me, if you want to follow me, you must pick up your cross daily and get in line, buddy. You see, the cross was his purpose. And if we want true joy, we have to find a way to make it ours. What does that look like? It means this. Because I think the most overlooked word in the entire Bible is right in the middle of that verse. It's the word daily. Daily. Every morning when I wake up, daily. I make a decision. Daily. When my feet hit the ground, daily. I make a decision. What purpose do I live for? Do I live for my own agenda and the things I want to do? Or do I pick up a cross? Do I lay my life down and joy? Joy comes not in the pursuit of self. Joy comes in the pursuit of Jesus. And Jesus found joy in his purpose. And he found joy in obeying his father, right? Those are the two things. If you're taking notes, there's one more. Jesus found joy in sinners, in sinners being saved. Uh, the Gospels are super clear on this, like right? the story of the prodigal son, Luke 15, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and all those stories. But my favorite, though, is Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus rallies up 72 of his, of his disciples and he says, hey guys, here's what I want you to do. And he, he kind of sends them on a mini mission trip, right? He says, I want you to go out for like three days and you're going to go door to door, town to town. You're going to knock on the door and say, hey, I know you don't know me. Can I sleep here? Can you feed me? Would that work out? And if they say no, by the way, just shake the dust off your feet, go to another house, right? And you're going to preach the gospel. And oh, by the way, I'm going to give you my power and you're going to be able to heal people, right? And so they go out. And the Holy Spirit like falls and they're preaching and teaching and they're healing every sickness and demons are being cast out and they can't believe it. I mean, they woke up that morning, ordinary men, and their heads hit the pillow that night and they are super heroes, right? It's unbelievable. And when they come and they report back to Jesus, they're jacked up, they're sized. They're like, Jesus, Jesus, you're never going to believe it. And you have to understand why they're so excited. You have to understand this because most of those disciples were rejects. They grew up in the rabbinical system, which means they tried to be disciples. They tried to follow rabbis. They didn't make the cut. They didn't have what it takes, right, to be a disciple. So that's why when they're finally doing disciple type things, you see that reaction. It's like Dryden when she made the varsity team as a freshman, right? And I have recorded on my cell phone her reaction when she saw she made that team. It's unbelievable. Why? Because when she was a freshman at Gainesville Middle School, they told her, you don't have what it takes, right? And so here's what goes down. They return to Jesus, Luke 10, 17. The 72,000 return. They're on cloud nine. Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. You should have seen it, Jesus. And here's what Jesus says when his peeps come back. He said, listen, I, I, you think that's impressive? I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. 
I have, have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Listen, uh, I've given you uh, power so that the enemy can't touch you and nothing will get in your way. However, he said, don't rejoice that spirits submit to you. That's small stuff for God. Rejoice, your names are written in heaven in the book of life. And at that time, Jesus, filled with joy from the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have taken, you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, and you've taken them and handed them over to little children in your eyes. Yes, Father, this is what you were pleased to do. I love this. I love this because it was his purpose, and it was how he obeyed his Father, and the result all wrapped up into one sinner Sinners being saved and nothing, nothing gets Jesus more pumped up than that. He was literally exploding with joy. And by the way, at first the disciples read the text, they missed it. Like verse 20, what do they say? They're like, hey, Jesus, look at all the cool stuff we can do, right? They missed it. Listen, I asked all of my kids this, uh, like a week or so ago, I said, hey, come over, one at a time, come over to my desk. And I asked them this question. I said, if you could have any superpower at all, what superpower would you choose? Dryden said, it's simple, Papa, teleportation, right? I could snap my fingers and be with mom in California. I could snap my fingers and be at a beach somewhere. Teleportation, I'm like, it's pretty cool. So he said, I want to fly, which I feel a lot like slaying that one. How cool would it be to get that perspective on everything, to be up there flying with the birds? Unbelievable. Max said she wants to be like Flash, faster than a speeding bullet. Like, and I'm like, Mac, you're like kind of sort of already there. Lily, <laughs> Lily said she wants to use her ballet skills to hurt people. There's a superhero we're excited about. Talk about a movie they're not going to make. Thad, Thad said he wants to be invisible. I'm like, that's a little bit creepy, buddy, what you're going to do with that skill. And then Salsa, Salsa, I said, well, and remember, she's a big Frozen fan, Elsa, all that. So I said, Salsa, what do you want to do? What do you want your superpower to be? And she says, I want to freeze people. I said, oh, so you want to freeze people? She said, well, no. I just really want to freeze Thad. And that was it, which is kind of cool. Listen, the 72, they had superpowers. You have cancer, sir? Not anymore. Oh, you? You can't walk? You're a cripple? Here, get up because I just signed you up for a 5K. And you? You've got a demon? The, the exorcist style has been tormenting you? By the way, this I have to tell you this story. Speaking of exorcisms, when Dryden was eight months old, right? She's laying in my arms one day and I'm doing what all parents do. They make weird sounds for their kids. And I'm going, blah, 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 blah. and I'm just making these sounds, right? And then I made this one sound. I looked at her and I'm like, I went, uh, right? For whatever reason. And then I'm looking at her and she repeats it perfectly to me. I'm like, whoa, that's kind of freaky. And then I rolled back my eyes and I did it again. And she rolled back her eyes and did it. I said, Dryden, you sound like the exorcist, right? And I said that to her. And when she heard that word exorcist, she connected it with what she was doing. And what I had on my hands, greatest baby trick of all time. When she was eight months old, I would walk up to people and go, Dryden, do the exorcist. And she would roll her eyes back and go, uh. She freaked out a lot of people, right? But they're casting out demons and they're overjoyed with their new abilities, right? And Jesus says, not so fast. Forget the abilities. I mean, that's nothing for God. What you should be excited about, verse 20, is this. Names are being written in the book of life. That should be your source. That should be your source of joy. Listen, I sat in a coffee shop two months ago with a kid named Hayden Goff right? Hayden Goff. Now, he's a sophomore Patriots baseball player. He's a good-looking kid, athletic, smart, all that kind of a deal. And I know his sister, Lainey, too, because Lainey's a volleyball player. She played with Dry to Gainesville Middle and then Slay last year. She'll be going to Patriot next year. I coached Lainey in camps, uh, I don't know, years ago anyways, but I got to know the parents sitting at volleyball matches. And so we're sitting there at Dunkin' Donuts. It was right before the lockdown. And in the middle of our conversation, Hayden says these words to me. He says, something was missing, right? And that phrase stood out to me, here's why. Because most people looking at his life, I go, like, dude, what's missing? Because by most people's standards, Hayden has a pretty good life, lives in a nice house, he's got a great family, he's athletic, good looking, his parents love him, he's smart. Like, you look at a kid and you're going, what possibly could be missing, right? But let me give you the backdrop to the story. Uh, Hayden landed in church quite accidentally, and here's how he landed in church. As most of you know, on December 4th, we had a house fire. And uh, it was devastating for us and the church, the community kind of wrapped their arms around us and, and picked us up. And, and as a result, four days later on Sunday morning, there was a bunch of people that attended Gateway that first day of the 8th, Martin, December 8th or whatever it was, after the fire that just showed up to encourage us, to let us know, hey, if you ever need anything, just know that we're here. And Hayden and his dad walked in that morning just to encourage, not to stay for months and months, not to become members, just to offer their love and support. They kept coming back week after week, Sunday after Sunday, because Hayden 
was hearing a message about Jesus that was starting to penetrate his heart and it landed him in a coffee shop at Dunkin' Donuts two months ago. And while we're having this conversation, we're sitting there and we're talking about him and I'm, I'm telling him, well, this is kind of what it means to be a Christ follower. This is what forgiveness of sins is. Listen, in that coffee shop, Hayden Goff crossed from death to life. It's unbelievable. And I'm going to tell you something that I told him when he had that conversation that day in the coffee shop, all right? I remember having this, and I said, hey, guess what, buddy? Thank God for the house fire. No joke, because if, if losing my home is what God needed to allow to get a hold of you, then sayonara home ski, right? Good riddance home. I'll deal with the headache. I'll deal with the insurance stuff. I'll deal with the, all the horrible things that have happened as a result of that. That's fine. Your name is written in the book of life. And so, in other words, woo! my house burnt down because you can't put a price tag on that. It filled me with so much joy. And I dare to say this, this world offers a lot of highs. You can find them a lot of different ways. Sex, drugs, alcohol, adrenaline seeking activities. I get it. Like the world can offer you a lot of joys. There is no high that can compare to a sinner being saved. So what are you going to do about it? Are you going to join and get on board the mission we were given by Christ Jesus? Listen, you want true joy? It's fine. Like a lot of us spend time in prayer asking God for God, can you please increase my joy? And we should pray that prayer. But he already showed us in his book how to get it. His son taught us how to get it. Obey God. Live for your purpose. And take seriously the call to make disciples. And you just watch God begin to use you to bring salvation to someone's life. Listen, you do that. And there is nothing in the world that will steal your joy. Because the Holy Spirit will just hand it to you in spades. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you to stop for a moment and just ponder and pray. I'm going to ask Brother Justin to, to lead us in a time of meditation and prayer, and he's going to have some announcements for us. So if you'd bow your heads with me, that would be a fantastic. Pastor Jacques, thank you for that message. Gateway, will you take a minute and just pray with me as we close out this time of worship? Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love that you pour out over us so freely, so undeservedly. Lord, if there be any, uh, anyone watching or listening in today that has still not been born again, adopted into your family, we pray that you would bring about uh, true conviction of sin, that you would testify to them of their need of salvation, that you would draw them to their self, you would grant them repentance and faith, and they would cry out, they would call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. For those of us who already have, Lord, who have been adopted into your family, we thank you, Lord. There are no words to express the amount of thankfulness that we feel. That even though we were sinners, Lord, that you came in and you laid down your life voluntarily to adopt us, to, to redeem us from our sin and from, from your prison, to make us sons and daughters of the Most High. So we thank you, Lord, for your work within us. Father, as, as we listen to this message today, as we, as we search the scriptures and we, we seek for truth, we thank you, Lord, for the the truths that Jacques has laid before us. We thank you, Lord, for the clear teaching that, that joy is not something we do, that a feeling we, we conjure up on our own, but it is a gift from God. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. So, Lord, we ask for, for more of the Spirit's presence, that you would fill us with the Spirit. We know that when we are filled with the Spirit, that we will testify of Jesus Christ. As we talked about today, that there's nothing that brings greater joy in heaven than when one sinner repents and that Christ came to seek and save the lost, to call sinners to repentance, as the scriptures tell us. So Lord, we pray that as your body, as your people, as the church of Gateway, that you would call us to obedience to this task, to proclaim the good news and make obedient disciples of all the nations, of all people around us, starting first within our neighborhoods and continuing out from there. Please draw us to obedience, to boldness, Lord, and as we do this, as you promise us in John 14, you know that you will reveal yourself to us in greater, 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 greater ways. And that your joy will be made full within us. Pray, Lord, that you be with all those who are hurting or sick or have lost loved ones recently. That you would pour out a special favor of your grace. 
for our brother Lane and his family as he's shared again today about their transition and their move. Pray that you would watch over them, lead them, and guide them as they can uh, continue out this process over the next few weeks. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of fellowship and that even though we be separate in body, we know that we are united in spirit. We thank you, Lord, for that. I ask your rich blessings and safety upon the people of Gateway for the rest of this day, rest of this week, until we meet again. We ask all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. All right, Gateway, so just a couple of quick reminders. Uh, so first is, is giving. We talk about this every week, but uh, for those that, that are led to, to give or to support the ministry in any way, you can do that in a couple ways. One is through our church app. You can download the church app and give that way. You can go online to gbcnobel.com, and there's an online giving portion there. Uh, or for those that would prefer uh, just a good old-fashioned paper check, which is always fine as well, uh, you can mail that in to the church uh, mailing address, which is also on our website, as well as probably on the screen right now. Thank you very much. Uh, and just really just as, as we continue to navigate this, this time throughout the pandemic and just all the weirdness that's going on, I just really wanted to say thank you on behalf of the entire church leadership team uh, for your continued faithful giving and specifically in this area of ministry. So, so important. So thank you again for your faithfulness in that. Um, second thing, and I'm really, really excited about this um, as a leadership team, uh, not only with the, the elder team that we've talked about the last couple weeks, but also as an extended leadership team with some of the ministry leaders last week. We're, we're really, really excited about this great opportunity that we have coming up. Uh, it's going to be kicking off this upcoming Wednesday night, and we're just going to be calling it Connect Groups. So Wednesday night, uh, starting at 6.30, there's a great opportunity for basically the entire family to plug into the Word of God. So we're going to be having uh, for our students, which we have pretty much forever, 6.30 to 8 o'clock like normal. Um, but we're also adding an additional option for younger kids, uh, preschool all the way up through basically fifth grade. Uh, so both of those groups are going to uh, kick off simultaneously at 6.30. Um, it's going to be electronically through Zoom. It's going to be two different uh, sessions. So students will kind of have their own meeting and their own kind of hang time. And then other uh, the younger kids will have theirs as well starting at 6.30. So they both start. Um, younger kids will go shorter, probably about a half hour or so. And then Students will go a little bit before 8, uh, kind of like we typically do. Um, so we have both of those kicking off at 6.30. And then we have for adults, which is also really exciting, uh, Pastor Jacques and myself, we're going to be kind of co-leading uh, a time of just reading and diving into the scriptures, which will be awesome. So really look forward and encourage if you're able to make it. Uh, that would be great. Again, that's going to be 8 o'clock starting then, and we're going to go for an hour, so roughly 8 to 9. So all the details uh, are going to be sent out by email as well as on the website as well. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to anyone on the leadership team, um, as well as check out the church website. But uh, really, really excited about this new opportunity just to truly help bring and build on those connections that matter, which is the heartbeat of Gateway, um, by just digging into the Word. You know, Jesus tells us specifically that we're sanctified, not by what we do, not by church attendance, but by the truth, and His Word is truth. Uh, so can't stress enough the importance of digging into the Word of God together in community. So we're really, really excited to have that option available for everybody in the family uh, starting Wednesday night. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, giving we went over, connect groups we went over. Last thing is just the transition. I know that uh, our brother Lane already kind of reiterated that they're going to be moving and I'm going to be taking over as the, uh, as the chairman of the elders, which is, I really can't explain the how humbling it is to even have my name associated with that position. Uh, so even though I know without a question or without any doubt that the Lord has called me to that specifically for this time in the history of Gateway, but I would just ask for your prayers, uh, for my prayers for, for my wife and I and our boys um, as we kind of go through and we navigate this season as well. Uh, so just keep the church in prayer, keep the leadership in prayer, and uh, I'm, I'm super excited to be able to just step out into this new area of ministry uh, and excited for, for the future of Gateway as we kind of move into the, to the next phase. So love you guys all so much. Miss seeing everybody and look forward to seeing you again in person, hopefully in the near future. Uh, but if not, Lord willing, well, that will happen whenever he's ready for it. So uh, if you need anything, as always, feel free to reach out to anybody on the leadership team. I'd be happy to assist with anything at all, whether it's finances, whether it's just talking to someone because it's getting boring, whatever the case is. Uh, groceries, you name it. Shopping, anything that you need. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we love you guys and we'll see you next week. Have a great day. Thank you.